Under these arid fields, 40 miles south of Phoenix, Arizona, lies rather unassuming and protected one of the largest prehistoric settlements in North America. Archaeologists have named it the Gru Casa Grande site. Dating to 1,000 years ago, this Hohokam village was about two square miles in size. The earliest portion, called Gru, was occupied from about 700 to 1100 AD. By the 1300s, the village had expanded to where the ruins of Casa Grande stand today. During several field seasons, Northland research archaeologists under the sponsorship of the Arizona Department of Transportation are given the valuable opportunity to excavate an area that is considered to be the heart of a residential district. Nearby is also an unexcavated ball court. As part of this ADOT road expansion project, they will be sampling another significant locale, which may demonstrate the architectural transition between the early pit houses of Gru and the adobe great house at Casa Grande. Northland Research will not be the first to conduct archaeology here. About 65 years ago, in fact, the Gru site became the first Hohokam ruin to be formally investigated by archaeologists. Julian Hayden himself assisted on the excavation in 1930 and 31 with the Los Angeles County Museum. Today he revisits the site to share old stories and valuable insights from the past. Archaeology is probably as close as we can ever come to defining the truth of the human experience throughout time. This science requires the meticulous task of unearthing a given spot and then attempting to learn as much as possible from every square inch of soil that is exposed. Since Hohokam archaeology has been assembling data for over 65 years, researchers at the Gru Casa Grande excavation are treating this work as an opportunity to not only find new things, but also to solve many of the unanswered questions that have challenged them for decades. They have already identified specific key research topics which will be investigated throughout the project. These include the size and scale of the population, what the residents ate and how they prepared it, how the village was constructed and laid out, and what function public architecture, such as ball courts, had 1,000 years ago. We estimate that the Gru Casa Grande settlement was about two square miles in size and may have held between 3,000 and 5,000 people at the peak of its occupation, which makes it roughly comparable in size to some of the modern towns in the vicinity, Coolidge and Florence in particular. During the first 400 years that the Gru site was thriving, the population lived in semi-subterranean structures built of mud and brush. These pit houses had entryways that opened out into a courtyard area, which was shared by neighboring houses. This combination of houses and courtyard are referred to as courtyard groups. This is where the cooking, pottery, and tool making and many of the daily family activities took place. I'm walking into this pit house now through the entryway, the same way that this house would have been entered almost a thousand years ago. As you can see, the entryway sticks out from the main part of the house and generally is just a little tongue of the floor that is apart from the main section of the floor. As you can see, this house is generally rectangular in shape, which is a very common shape for these pit houses. Because the mesquite and cottonwood used to build these dwellings does not lend itself to tree ring dating methods, desert archaeologists must use a variety of other techniques. These include detailed analysis and dating of the pottery, radiocarbon dating, which is based on measuring the radioactive decay in organic materials, and archaeomagnetic dating, which involves analyzing soil samples from fire pits found at the site. One of the things we're investigating on this project is how the site grew, developed over time, how the site was laid out, the organizational structure of the site, and again, how that may have changed over time. The inhabitants of Gru helped construct what is probably the largest and most sophisticated canal system in North America. 
This system originated about six miles east of nearby Florence, and the canals ran for close to 20 miles in length, providing water to fields and four other major communities. Here it grew, excavations have exposed the gray sediments which show where a canal once flowed. These labor-intensive irrigation ditches were diverting water from the nearby Gila River. Today, its sandy bed usually stands dry and lifeless. However, 1,000 years ago, the Gila probably flowed throughout the entire year, but was also susceptible to droughts and floods which could have wiped out the entire canal system. One of the interesting developments in Hohokam archaeology in recent years is that we're we're finding out that the Hohokam probably developed their canal and irrigation technology on their own, that in many respects it was more sophisticated than contemporaneous irrigation systems in some of the high civilizations in northern Mexico and central Mexico. The growing, harvesting, and preparing of food was no doubt a vital activity for a village with such a large population and so many mouths to feed. The remnants of this important part of everyday life can also give archaeologists insight into how a community was socially organized and how family groups may have interacted within it. One especially exciting find is the approximately 25 large roasting ovens, or ornos. As these are uncovered and recorded, they look as if they were used only recently. These funnel-shaped pits are lined with a distinct black organic rind from food items, such as agave hearts, which were a popular diet for the Hohokam. The sheer number of ovens at the edge of the village, not far from the ball court, may indicate that they were used for feasting or to entertain visiting groups. Since these people did not leave us with a written or other obvious history about themselves, their limited remains through architecture and artifacts are the building blocks which archaeologists use to understand some of the more ideological expressions of Hohokam culture, such as religious practices, art styles, and ceremonies, which no doubt were also an important part of their lives. One of the great architectural enigmas which has fascinated Hohokam archaeology for almost a century are the large oval depressions which many archaeologists believe to have been used as ball courts. The games played in them are thought to be related to a Mesoamerican type where the losers were later offered to the gods. We do know that the Gru site was one of the largest villages here in the Gila River uh, Valley. Uh, in that context, it makes perfect sense that one of the largest courts would have been here. It would have been a gathering place for many, many peoples who lived in other villages outside. And the court must have been significant. I'm on the floor of the ball court, a fairly level surface. It does come and slope up towards the wall, but when it meets the edge of the wall, it rises quite sharply. That's one of the unusual things we learned by this excavation. Uh, in the past, we thought that the walls banked a little more gradually up, but we're finding that, in fact, the transition from floor to wall is quite sharp, which would allow a, a ball to bounce off of it more readily. During a second field season, Northland Research archaeologists excavated several early adobe walled houses farther west of the ball court, just outside today's Casa Grande National Monument. Once again, they made some interesting discoveries. One of the fascinating things about this project is that it's giving us an opportunity to look at how a large, again, one of the largest prehistoric villages shifted over time. We have over it grew an area that was occupied again from about 700 to 1100, and we see the whole settlement moving to the west, eventually getting over towards the big house at Casa Grande. This shift in location is also accompanied by an architectural change or transition. For roughly 400 years, the residents of Gru were living in freestanding mud and brush pit houses. 
What caused them to change to above ground and then multi-storied adobe structures, archaeologists still are not sure. One of the, the major differences between the two forms of architecture, we consider a pit house a light wall construction that uh, insulates and delays the temperature getting into the house. Uh, on the other hand, adobe architecture, these are thick, massive walls, some of them as, as thick as three feet. Um, the ones that we've got here at this portion of the site are probably only about a foot thick, so they're not as big as the ones over at the monument. As archaeological methods continue to become more sophisticated and as more sites are unearthed, our understanding of these remains becomes more clear. A common question that continues to be asked is, where did the Hohokam civilization and people go? The most obvious response is that they are still here. As a member of the Gila River Indian community, we strongly believe that we are direct descendants of the ancient civilization that is identified as Hohokam by uh, the scholars of today. It is a strong belief and it is, is still ongoing even today. Several Native American groups in Arizona consider themselves to be among the descendants of the Hohokam. These include specific clans of the Hopi tribe and the Tahona Ohotam and Pima communities. As a park ranger at Casa Grande National Monument, Nathan Allen walks a thin line between archaeology and the beliefs of his people. For many Gila River community members, Casa Grande and Gru are sacred sites, places to be visited only occasionally and with great respect. At the same time, Nathan supports the preservation and managed protection that is currently bestowed on these ancient villages surrounding his homeland. When my dad always spoke, he always said before the, the Spaniards came. This is the way it was when he would talk, but he had all the songs. Most of the singing is about animals and what was around them at the time. But they also are songs of, uh, for bringing rain and water. Uh, the river wasn't always the main supplier of water. They were also very dependent on rainfall, which in turn replenished the waters of the rivers. So there is a song about a black mountain and the clouds that began to build behind it. I don't know the, the words of the song, but it was translated. And the black clouds build over and they come over. And I stand there and I stand there and I try to remember the song. I try to remember the words that will bring the rains to me. That will try to bring the rains to me. But I've forgotten, I've forgotten the words.